translational and rotational parameters in DNA structure. Now, these translational and rotational uh, movements is basically a characteristic of the helix itself. There are a lot of conformational changes that happen because of these translational and rotational parameters. So, the session is going to basically focus on how between two base pairs or between or within a base pair, you may have different, uh, you know, movements happening because of which you can have different conformations possible. So, what are the learning outcomes of this session? When one envisages a DNA in a 3D form, okay, that is uh, looking at a three-dimensional structure, so you are going to take into consideration all the three axes, that is x-axis, y-axis, and the z-axis, one would find that there are innumerable interactions and movements. And this makes the DNA not just flexible, but highly dynamic. So you can see that constantly they keep changing. And uh, this is one reason why you have different forms of DNA possible. That is one form of DNA can change into another form of DNA just because of these uh, you know, changes within the helix per se. So around the imaginary helical axis, you can have movements not just in the backbone of the DNA, which means we are talking about the sugar phosphate backbone, but you can also have movements that are happening within the two anti-parallel stra uh, strands, which means we are basically looking at the base stacks and within base pairs. So you can have translational and rotational relation of bases within a single base pair. So those are called as intra-base pair translational and rotational parameters. While you can have translational and rotational relationship between two stacked base pairs and they are then called as step base pairs or they are called as what is called as inter-base pair translational and rotational parameters. Now let us Understand that when you look at the helix, there are several torsion angles that are present in the helix. In fact, uh, a lot was, uh, you know, elucidated from the experiments of the dodecamer oligonucleotide by Richard and Dickerson. And of course, there were many other scientists who too worked on the same lines. And from all these, uh, one would able to uh, you know, find that there are several angles uh, around which you can have movement and, or sorry, you have sev several bonds around which you can have movement and therefore those form what is called the torsion angles. So you may notice over here that when you are looking at, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of, this is the, uh, you know, five, uh, this is the backbone. So you have Basically, the sugar present over here, this is the sugar, the deoxyribose sugar, which is attached to phosphate at one end over here and another phosphate at one end. So, you know that you have a phosphodiester bond at each end of the sugar molecule and the sugar molecule per se is attached to the base over here. So, when you, uh, when you look at the number of bonds around which you can have rotations or you can have movements, you'll find that you have Say this is the C, C5 prime carbon of the sugar. So between the C5 prime and the OH of the, so you have a CH2OH. So between the carbon of the CH2OH and the OH, you will have a, a possibility of a bond where you can have movement. So that is what is called as the beta torsion angle. You can have between the OH and the phosphate, that is called as the alpha torsion angle. You can have between the C4 carbon and the C5 carbon of the sugar and that is the gamma angle. Similarly, you can have between the C4 and the C3, that is delta, between the C3 and its OH, which is the epsilon, and between the O3 and the phosphate, again, that is the zeta. So you can see that within this backbone itself, you will find there are six torsion angles. Other than that, the one that is present between the carbon 1 of the deoxyribose and the uh, base, which is the N-glycosidic bond, uh, bond, you can have movement around that as well. And so that torsion angle is represented by chi torsion angle. So this is not really part of the backbone of the helix, but 
you would find movement around it and so you can have conformational changes occurring. Then you can have movement within the bonds that are present in the deoxyribosugar itself. So what has been observed is that suppose you have movement or rotation around the alpha or so you have you know a rotation based on the alpha and the gamma then there is possibility of a non-canonical local conformation. What do we mean by non-canonical? So when you have the uh, you know uh, there is a change in the uh, turn around a bond so it is moving out of the rule so there is a certain dimension that a, that a DNA would have okay when it is say for example in a relaxed state or when it's say for example not interacting with another molecule so then that is what is called as a canonical DNA or canonical confirmation but when it shifts or moves away from that canonical uh, uh, dimension then it is what is called as non-canonical so what is observed is when you have rotation around the alpha and the gamma, then there is a decrease in the twist. And this has been observed when you have, you know, protein DNA interactions happening. So when a protein binds to the DNA, there are possibilities of the twisting of the DNA getting reduced. And that is, that is, that is accomplished because you have a rotational change around the alpha and the gamma. Now, that is one example. Similarly, you can observe that if there is a rotation around the end glycosidic bond, which means if the torsion angle psi changes, then you can have what is called as the anti and the syn conformation. Likewise, you have any change which is happening within the deoxyribose. We all know that it leads to what is called as a sugar endopucker structure. So you can have uh, anywhere from uh, a C3 prime exo pucker, a C3 prime endopucker, or you can have a C2 prime endopucker or a C2 prime exopucker. So the sugar conformations can change also depending on the movement around its base, uh, around its bonds present within the sugar itself. So uh, this basically is suggesting that you have various regions where you can have such movements and based on that you can have different conformations within the helix. Let us look at one more confirmation that has been observed experimentally especially. So zeta and epsilon is between the C3 prime uh, uh, carbon of the uh, ribose sugar and the OH. So this epsilon is between the C3 prime carbon and its OH, right? So this is the 3 prime OH that is present and between the OH, 3 prime OH and the phosphate, that is the zeta. So uh, when you have a change in the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the bond uh, movement, so you can see that here the confirmation is such when it is twisted or when it is rotated, you have a different confirmation. So this confirmation is what is called as the B1 confirmation and this is what is called as the B2 confirmation. So you can see this, uh, you know, different confirmation. So there are two different confirmations that are present in the backbone of the DNA thanks to the uh, bond uh, torsion angles of epsilon and the zeta changing. And because they change, you have these two confirmations. Experimentally, it has been found that both the confirmations can actually coexist. And it has also been observed that you have more of the B1 confirmation uh, than the B2 confirmation in the BDNA itself. Now, if you go to ADNA, which is another form of DNA, the B1 and the B2 confirmation percentage may vary. So therefore, you would observe that, you know, these are the torsion angles around which you can have changes happening. So this is pertaining to where you can have movement in the backbone of the DNA, that is a sugar phosphate or between the sugar and the base. Now we come to the aspect where you can have rotation or you can have translational movement uh, in the base pairs, okay. So, uh, this is now looking at within the two anti-parallel strands. So, in the B form of DNA, you will observe or whenever we draw a DNA or whenever we look at a DNA, we always find that the base pairs are centered around the central helix, helical axis. Even though it is an ima imaginary axis, we know that the base pairs are always centered around this helical axis. So, when you draw a DNA, and if suppose this is the imaginary helical axis, you will always find 
that the base pairs are centered around the helical axis per se. So, depending on the translation and the rotational parameters of these axis base pairs, you can have different parameters. So, you can have translational parameters. Of the translational parameters, if the translation is around the x axis, then you have what is called as the x displacement. If it is around the y axis, then you have what is called as the y displacement. Right? So, suppose you have the x axis, okay? This, uh, suppose you have the x present here and y here, or you have the x present here and the y here, okay? And if you have the base pair on the x axis, okay? And this, this base pair, together trans moves as a single body. So now it is a base pair that is moving as a single body when it moves this way, right? Then that is what is called as X displacement, okay? So I we can look at it again. You have it right at the center of the helical axis, but when it can shift on the X axis itself, you have what is called as the X displacement possible. You can also have Y displacement. So here you have it present on the x-axis with relation to the y-axis. And suppose this base pair moves towards in the direction of the y-axis. You can see that it has moved. So this is a translation. As a whole body, it has moved from its original position to another position. Okay. So this is what is called as a translational movement that is there within the base pair itself. Now let us look at the rotational parameters. So, one of the rotational parameters is what is called as inclination. So, inclination is when the rotational parameter is around the x-axis and tip is when the rotation is around the y-axis. So, when you have the base pair, so you would have the base pair present as this, correct? It would have been present like this, okay? But now it has, with respect to the x-axis, it has tilted a little while in this case, with respect to the y-axis, it has tilted a little. And so this is called as a tip and this is called as an inclination. So when you compare it here, the movement of the base pair is in this direction. And here the movement of the base pair is in this direction. So if this is the base pair, you go like this, it is an inclination. And you go like this, it is a so basically, you will have to imagine that when you have a rotation around the x-axis, it leads to inclination. And when you have a rotation around the y-axis, it leads to tip. And this and this are two different conformations. So you can see by lieu of the way the base pair is moving, okay, around the central helix, helical axis itself, you can have two different conformations. Now let us look at, so you can have base pair parameters with respect to one single base pair, but you can also have translational and rotational parameters within a base pair. And when that is the case, then that is what is called as an intra-base pair. So let us look at the translation of the base pairs within, I mean the translation uh, relation of the bases within the base pair around the different axes. So suppose you look at the x-axis. So this is say the x-axis, this is the y-axis and this is the z-axis. When you look at the 3D conformation. So as a base pair, this should have been present like that, correct? It should have been present like this. But what is happening is because one base of the base pair as a single body moves this side of the x-axis and this is moving this side of the x-axis, you have what is called as a shear. It's called as a shear because there is a strain created when the two base pairs move away from each other. Two and this translational movement is around the x-axis. So you can see that you have what is called as a shear. Suppose it is the y-axis. Okay, so this is the y-axis. So this as a single body moves here and this as a single body moves here. So then what happens is that between the two base pairs, uh, between, sorry, between the two bases in a base pair, you have the distance between the two increasing and that leads to what is called as a stretch. Similarly, when you have the uh, translation around the z-axis, you can have one base as a body moving this side and the other base moving this side. 
So you can see with respect to each other, they are basically rising and it leads to what is called as a staggered conformation. So you can see that simple movements towards a particular direction leads to shear, stretch and stagger. Similarly, you can have rotation around the axis and when you have rotation around the axis, you are now looking at a movement which is around the axis, but this is not in one direction. This is basically turning. So when you have as a single base, you know, with respect to the x axis, so this is the x axis, so it moves like this and this fellow moves like this, then you have what is created as a buckle in y axis. This is something that we all know, which is the propeller twisting. You have one base of the base pair moving in one direction with respect to the x-axis and this base moving in the other direction with respect to the uh, x-axis. So uh, this is what is called as a twist, a propeller twist. Likewise, what you could have is, so this is now going to be a rotation around the z-axis. So this base moves in this direction and this base moves in this direction. So with respect to each other, you can see that uh, only one part of the uh, base pair within the base, the two bases are moving away and opening over here a gap. So therefore, this is called as the opening. So you can see how within a base pair, that is intra-base pair, you can have translational and rotational parameters. Now we look at how you can have the same kind of translational and rotational parameters with respect to two stacked base pairs. So you're looking at one base pair as a rectangle and another base pair as a rectangle. So the movement of these two uh, 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 rectangles with respect to each other is what is called as the interbase pair. And that is more generally referred to as a step base pairing because each base pair forms a step in the ladder of the DNA. Of course, all imaginary, we consider that a base pair is a step in the ladder. That is why it is called as a step base pairing. So let us look at translation around the different axes. So when you have x axis and one of the, uh, you know, base pair sliding away towards the x axis in this direction, and this is moving towards this direction, then you can see there is a literal shift. When you have, uh, you know, this as the y-axis, when one base pair moves towards, towards one side of the y-axis and the other base pair towards the other side. So this can be the positive uh, slide and this is a negative slide. But with respect to each other, therefore, what you observe is a slide. Then you can have this base pair moving towards the positive uh, uh, z and, uh, axis and this towards the negative z axis. Or this remains at the position and this moves towards one side, then this is what is called as rise, okay? So these are translational movements with respect to two base pairs and therefore inter-base pair. Similarly, you have rotation around the axis. So when you have, you can see that this is an inclination as you can see, you know, x-axis, it is moving with respect to the x-axis and this is moving with respect to the x-axis. So you have what is called as a tilt form. And this over here will be what is called as a tilt angle. Okay. Now, when you have a y-axis, you can see that you have one entire base pair moving with respect to the y-axis in this direction and this base pair moving in this direction. So therefore, you have what is called rolling. So you will have a roll angle between these two. Likewise, you can have a twist. This is something that we understand when we look at DNA as a beta helix. You can you, you know that every stacked base pair is twisting around each other to form one helical turn. So you can see that with respect to the z-axis, this base pair has moved in this direction, while this base pair has moved in this direction. And therefore, between the two, there is a twist angle present. So these are when you consider inter-base pair, translation and rotational parameters. Now we will just look at some simple examples of how you can have these within a DNA. So let's say for example, we consider two slabs. When you're considering two slabs, so this is one step and this is the other step. So this is one base pair and this is the other base pair. So if you look at the three axes per se, you can basically relate to when you're looking at the y-axis, 
you can call it the roll and the slide. Slide is when there is a translation and roll is when there is a rotation. When you're looking at the twist, you know you can have again with respect to translation a rise and with respect to a rotation a twist. And similarly in this case, you can have uh, the shear, etc. Now, so this is what we understand by twist. When you have one entire base pair twisting around the z-axis, then this is the, when you have one base pair with respect to the y-axis moving, then you can have a roll. And when you have, with respect to the x-axis, you have an entire step moving towards either this side or it can move towards this side, you would have what is called as a slide. So basically, this is twist, this is roll, and this is slide. And twist, roll, and slide is the most frequented uh, or is most frequently occurring within the helix. Now let's consider you have the two, uh, you know, steps. So this is one base pair and this is the other base pair, okay? What you observe over here is that you neither have a roll nor you have a propeller twist. So let's consider roll is zero and propeller twist is zero. Now say for example, there is a propeller twist. So you can see propeller twist is plus 20 and you can see that both of the bases on the same side okay or on the same strand are twisting with respect to the other base in the other strand so you will find that as our z axis whole z axis you do not have a roll why because you do not have this entire base pair rolling with respect to the other but you only have a propeller twist so what does it indicate that even if you have a propeller twist it need not result in a change in the roll so, effectively what we are saying is that if you have a propeller twist, you should have a change in the roll. No, that is not necessary. But you can have that also. Now, say for example, here let us consider that roll is zero. Okay. But what you have is, now the stacking is such that you have a purin over here and a pyrimidine over here. And the other base is base pair is that you have a pyramid in here and a pure in here. Now, what you observe in this diagram is that this base pair has slided with respect to, has translated with respect to the y-axis and so you have a slide of plus 2. Okay. Uh, now, why does this happen? This happens only when there is a propeller twisting. Okay. So, you can see that in this base pair, the Pyrimidin has twisted and in this the purin has twisted. So again what you see is that in this strand you would have the two base pair, two, uh, two bases which are stacked over each other twisted and the other is not with respect to each other. So, so what would happen if there is no slide? So you see that if there is no slide you can see exactly that the base pairs are in the same you know within the same dimension there is no slide in such a case where there is no slide you will find that here there will be a steric hindrance you see the star over here so here you can see very well that there is hardly any distance between the two purins and because there is hardly any distance between the two purins there will be extreme steric hindrance to minimize that steric hindrance this has slid and so now there's a gap created. So this becomes more thermodynamically stable than this. So what is understood is that a positive slide has ensured that there is no steric hindrance because of the propeller twisting. So there is a propeller twist, but because to minimize steric hindrance due to the propeller twist, there is a slide. So it's basically that one kind of a parameter can influence the other parameter. Let's look at another example. So you have over here a purin again and a pyrimidin with a propeller twist of the pyrimidin over here. But in this base pair, you don't see this purin having a propeller twist, but it is this pyrimidin which has a propeller twist. So here the propeller twist is, you know, not the same side, but they are the different sides. And what is also observed is 
that this purin and this purin are stacking with each other. So the stacking is re responsible for making the DNA, uh, you know, stable. Now, to minimize any kind of steric hindrance, what is therefore observed is that you would have a slide towards the negative, okay? Since there is a slide towards the negative, you have base stacking possible over here. And to minimize steric hindrance, you would have a roll observed with respect to each other. And so, in this step base pair, due to cross stacking of the purines, one can see a negative slide and roll. And these two parameters are changing to minimize the steric hindrance. So, with change in slide, the role has changed due to a propeller twist. So here what you can see is the slide, the role, the twist, all matter in forming a particular conformation. One has also experimentally observed that when you have two base pairs and you look at the slide and the twist, okay, if the slide changes, the twist angle is differing. So you can see that experimentally this too has been observed. So you can have, with, uh, with respect to a change in the slide, a change in the twist also possible. So these were different examples of how, you know, different parameters within the helix can uh, take place or happen at the same time simultaneously. So to conclude, there are six torsion angles in the backbone of helix, one between the sugar and base and several movements within the sugar leading to various conformation changes in the helix. There can be translational and rotational relationship within a base pair with respect to different axes leading to shear, stagger, buckle, propeller twist and much more such conformations. There can be translational and rotational relationship between two stacked base pairs leading to what is called a slide, rise, tilt, roll, twisting within the helix. Depending on the base pairs present, adjacent AT or adjacent GC, it is interesting to know that a translational parameter may or may not influence a rotational parameter. Thus, the DNA helix is able to show various conformations due to rotations and translations around different axes, contributing not just to the flexibility but also the dynamism in the overall DNA. And this flexibility and dynamism is more needed when it interacts with not just itself, but with other molecules such as protein and RNA. Thank you.